my name is Tom Bisak and I'm the uh, Canyon County Parks Recreation and Waterways Director. Um, I'm also the County Historic Preservation Officer. So in 2014, Bill Nance, uh, archaeologist and former uh, Canyon County Historic Preservation Council member, uh, gave me a, a phone call and indicated that he had a petroglyph panel that he'd located on the Snake River that he thought I should take a look at. And um, I had uh, worked with Bill on recording rock art here at Celebration Park, and I knew he had a pretty good eye, and I was pretty interested in what he had to, had to show me. So I contacted Mark Plew at the Department of uh, Anthropology and Archaeology at Boise State University, and uh, Mark and I went down to meet Bill on the shores of the Snake River near Map Rock uh, uh, Petroglyph on Map Rock Road. And um, what we found there was a pretty large rounded boulder that was sticking about 20 inches out of the ground and, it, and all of the uh, surfaces that were exposed were covered with uh, petroglyphs. And we recognized it right away as a um, typical pit and groove motif and we were pretty excited about that because it's a relatively rare and a very interesting motif. So uh, Bill explained that the reason he had found it is was because he was uh, doing the 106 compliance for an irrigation system that was going to go in very near that stone. And it, upon inspecting the stone, we saw that it had been uh, moved around a little bit, uh, not completely out of the ground, but pushed around uh, because it had some scars on it that looked like they were made from heavy equipment. Um, since the construction was going to happen right around that stone, we thought that uh, the stone was uh, threatened and uh, endangered of being more damaged and uh, uh, Mark and Bill both urged me to uh, attempt to get uh, fee simple ownership of that stone and uh, preserve it somehow. So I, um, I thought about it for a while and I uh, contacted Sam Lougheed, who's our chief civil prosecuting attorney, and talked to him about acquiring stones and uh, what it would take for the county to get, a, get title on, on, on that particular rock. A couple weeks later, I was in a board meeting with the Canyon County Commissioners, and uh, one of the commissioners asked me if I knew Mark McDonough, who was the landowner where the where the stone was uh, located, and therefore the owner of the stone. And I said, I sure, uh, I sure do. And he said, well, his name came up in some code compliance uh, issues the other day, and uh, we, were, we were wondering how we could get a hold of him. Apparently, Mark had inherited the property. He was uh, living in Seattle and um, was not a resident. So um, I did some research, and we found out where, uh, where Mark was, and, and we contacted him and uh, worked out the code compliance issues. And in the meantime, I asked him uh, about the disposition of the stone, whether he'd be interested in donating it or not. Well, he wasn't real sure, uh, but he thought he'd consult his attorneys, and that's when, the, that's when everything slowed way down. <laughs> Uh, our attorneys talked to their attorneys, uh, or his attorney, uh, or attorneys, and uh, it, the conversation went back and forth for, for many months, and there were a lot of emails and, and uh, a lot of talk about what the donation would mean. And uh, eventually Mark learned enough about Celebration Park and uh, Candy County's work with uh, archaeological uh, education, environmental education, and, and uh, the school field trip program, uh, so that he began. He, he softened quite a bit, and um, and said that he would donate the stone, but he wouldn't donate it to uh, Canyon County. He'd have to donate it to a 501c3. Fortunately, I'm the secretary treasurer of the Southwest Idaho Resource Conservation and Development Council, which is a 501c3. So I um, made a proposal to that council that uh, we take the acquisition of the stone on as a project. And uh, that council thought it was a good idea too, so then Mark had his 501c3 to donate the stone to. At that point, we uh, thought we should move pretty rapidly before Mark changed his mind, so I contacted Inland Crane, and, uh, and we went down there and um, with the Crane people, a county commissioner, my assistant director, and the chief civil prosecutor, and when we got down to survey the situation to see how difficult it would be to move the stone out because we didn't know how big it was it was buried in the ground the rock was gone there was no stone to be seen and we panicked a little bit and uh, or at least i did because i had just uh, 
gone through quite a bit in order to get this rock, and now it wasn't there anymore. And so I thought perhaps uh, it was either pushed out of the way or um, the place had changed so much because of the construction that I wasn't looking at it properly. It was in the trees someplace else. And so we checked all the trees and all the bushes for, for yards and yards, hundreds of yards in either direction, and uh, we couldn't locate the stone. But uh, Steve Rule, the county commissioner, spotted a rock in the river that he thought was interesting, and he said, how about that rock out there? Will that rock do? And I looked at it, and it was the Pit and Groove Stone. And um, we'd seen it partially buried in the ground, and now we saw it partially submerged in the, in the river. And what was worse was that there was a series of broken rock that was leading up to that rock in the river, and the uh, individuals that had moved the rock had turned it into a fishing site. So I was really uh, concerned that perhaps during the pushing of the rock into the river, what they had done was taken a track hoe and smashed that rock. And then the only part that I'm seeing is, the, is a portion, and the rest of, the, rest of that petroglyph plant panel was actually the broken rock bridge. Nevertheless, I thought it would be worth salvaging, so I worked with the inland crane people, and um, we decided we would pull it out the very next week. We had to do some uh, trimming of trees and uh, measuring of bridges and, and things. And, and uh, when the crane arrived, we still didn't know how big the rock was. But um, we had kind of guessed by trying to reach around it in the in the river and to get an idea of its diameter. And, and um, with some uh, calculations, we thought that it may run somewhere between 10 and 11,000 pounds. At that point, I, I, uh, I had to decide what I was going to do with that rock if we did get it out. And uh, we knew we were going to bring it to Celebration Park, but I wasn't really sure of the placement. I thought perhaps I would put it on the deck here, the concrete deck around the Celebration Park, or around the Crossroads Museum. Uh, but then I thought better of that because it was, uh, I didn't think the, the deck would hold up to 11,000 pounds of basalt. And I didn't know what the rock looked like. Could have had a sharp edge on the bottom and punctured this thing. Um, so I had no idea how big it was. And I didn't want to lay it on the ground because I noticed that the petroglyphs earlier went way around the rock. So I thought perhaps if I put that rock on other rocks, it would be uh, it would be easier to see all the petroglyphs. But I still didn't know how big it was. But I got the crew uh, that does the maintenance for uh, all of my parks together, and uh, we came down here with a tractor and some concrete and some pipe, and we kind of guessed how big that rock was and we built a pedestal for it and s without knowing anything about the rock we just it was just a guess and we thought we would just set the rock on that five rock pedestal and uh, if it worked great if it didn't have to sit on the ground two or three days later the um, the crane operators came down with the crane um, there were archaeologists there lawyers lots of lawyers the Mark uh, Don, Donahoe, the, um, the rock owner, um, county commissioners, sheriff's department, parks people, all to witness this. And uh, we um, watched the crane company go into the water, put nylon straps around what parts of the rocks they could get a hold of, and then they hoisted it up out of the river. And as it came up out of the river, um, we finally got a, a look at the entire rock, and it had not been broken. It was all there. And um, it was big. You could, the crane company was able to weigh the rock on the crane. Cranes do that. And it weighed 7,500 pounds. So we underestimated the weight, but it was still heavy. Um, the, uh, Dave Loper, who was the director of the Canyon County Landfill, had brought a dump truck down that was half full of sand. So we could set the rock in the sand so it wouldn't rattle around in the dump truck. And uh, we drove it directly over here, followed by the crane hooked it up again and hoisted it uh, into the air and down onto the pedestal that we had constructed, hoping that the rock would fit. And it did. The rock fit right in the pedestal, just like a stone in the setting of a ring. It was, it fit. And um, we unstrapped it and said, pretty much the process of recovering the rock is complete. Primarily because we didn't want to ever pick that rock up again. Pretty heavy. My name is Palin Yu. I'm with the Department of Anthropology at Boise State University. I am an archaeologist by trade, and uh, I was asked by uh, Dr. Mark Plu, also at Boise State University, and Tom Bysack, director here of Celebration Park, uh, to.
do a little investigating on uh, this mysterious stone and what its possible purpose might have been back many, many thousands of years ago when it was originally created. So I was excited to give it a try. Uh, Celebration Park is well known for its beautiful petroglyphs, many of them in the shape of animals uh, or of geometrics. And this stone is different, very different from the, the rocks that we have, the petroglyphs that are, that are uh, uh, easy to see here at Celebration Park. So the, the stone in question, the mystery stone, is uh, called pit and groove type petroglyphs, usually in um, the Great Basin, which is sort of our geographic region. It's also called, uh, this kind of petroglyph is called cupule or cupule stones in, uh, uh, in Great Britain and in Australia. So it, it is basically, it's very tiny sort of circular little pits that have been pecked carefully into the rock along with grooves, sort of long serpentine grooves interspersed with those little pits. And it doesn't look like anything in particular. Uh, I think you could look at it and maybe see something the way that your eyes want to find a design or a pattern in, in clouds. Um, but there are many, many, probably hundreds of these small pits in this rock. So it really stands out. It's nothing like the, the rocks here at Celebration Park. And also its geographic location was in a substantially different location from Celebration Park. So um, Bill Nance and, and Tom Bysack and Mark Plew sus suspected that it really was a, a different kind of, of petroglyph. I did a big literature search looking for these kinds of stones and I was really excited and impressed to see that these kinds of cupule stones or pitagroove uh, stones have been found all over the world. Um, so there is one of the most common types of petroglyphs uh, created by people um, and even uh, there are some examples from France that date back to the period of the Neanderthals which is pretty amazing tens of thousands of years ago there's even one uh, uh, pit and groove or cupule stone that has been discovered in India that dates back well over half a million years ago uh, so this is a truly ancient type of petroglyph and although we know that in North America human beings were not here that early, still the fact that we have this kind of a petroglyph here really speaks to a great antiquity for this stone, I think. Um, there are techniques for dating these kinds of petroglyphs. This stone hasn't been dated uh, that way. We can look at uh, the weathering of the stone. We can look at uh, lichens that grow on the stone. In some cases you can obtain radiocarbon dates from those. Uh, there's varnish techniques. Uh, none of those have been used yet on this stone. But the fact of these little tiny pits with the serpentine grooves along it are um, reminiscent of some of the oldest petroglyphs in North America. Uh, so we know we have a, a number of examples from the Great Basin, including some from the area around Lakeview, Oregon and Eastern Oregon uh, that probably date back to just after the end of the Ice Age. So it's possible that this, this stone could have been modified by human hands uh, during the time when the climate of North America was really changing, uh, warming up, drying up, and uh, the great animals, the mammoth, the camels, the horses, uh, were going extinct around that period of time. Again, we can't be sure of that because we don't have a uh, radiometric date obtained by chemical or physical means, but the very nature of those petroglyphs sure looks like some of the oldest examples that have been dated securely from other areas of the Great Basin, which is really very cool. Um, the, uh, the geology of this rock has also been studied by Clint Hughes at the U.S. Forest Service, and he is a geologist. He was able to take X-ray fluorescence um, data from this rock, and he also used a microscope to look at its crystal structure, and he confirmed that this is definitely basalt from this area, but it's not the same kind of basalt as from Celebration Park. So it probably, the source of this rock, which has some rounding on it, so it was probably rolled by floodwaters in the very ancient past, but its original source is probably quite different from the source rocks here at Celebration Park. Um, it's chemically uh, different. It has different kinds of crystalline structures, different chemical makeup slightly, although it's still in the same basalt family. And some of the weathering of the rock 
appears to Clint to be associated perhaps to exposure to hot water over a long period of time. Uh, and we know that there are geothermal springs in the area just upstream of where this rock was found. So um, clearly you can see actually from the rock that its color is somewhat different, the texture is somewhat different, and the weathered surface of the rock is somewhat different. And those differences are associated with the very origins of where this rock was probably pushed out by floodwaters of the Great Ice Age floods, rolled around and tumbled a little bit, came to rest, and from everything that we can surmise, the very earliest occupants of this area noticed this special quality of this rock. Noticed that it had a, a unique color, a unique texture, unique shape compared to some of the other rocks of the area, and for reasons we cannot ever really truly know, they selected it. So although we know that People in the recent present, traditional peoples, um, have used uh, these kinds of marks to invoke rain or to invoke fertility or that kind of benefit for, for their community. Uh, the fact that these rocks are so truly ancient means that we may not know what the original creators of these marks may have intended uh, by these creations. And it could be that they were made for one reason and then converted to different uses by later peoples who uh, either moved into the area or are descendants of the original makers. Uh, if this rock um, and its marks are as ancient as I suspect, if they do date to the um, just after the last part of the, of the Ice Age, um, it's probably very difficult to make any real um, strong factual statement about what their intended uses may have been. The fact that this stone has such an important natural setting to it and um, and also the fact that we can't truly know what its function might have been, um, to me indicates that there might be more than one way to look at it in terms of a, of a, um, a stewardship angle or a protection angle. Uh, there's a category of, of protected cultural properties called traditional cultural properties um, in, in the federal parlance. And what it really means, and, and um, I think that uh, Native peoples would ag agree with us on this, what it means is that there are certain aspects of nature, there may be natural features or natural resource areas that to an uninformed eye may not have cultural significance, but to a knowledgeable eye does have cultural significance. So I can see that this rock, because we may not know what its exact function is, um, but we know it's culturally significant, might fit into that category of a traditional cultural property and the reason I think that we should consider this possibly is that it adds another layer of protection, another layer of significance to this very special rock. And if you think way back in time about how ancient this rock is, its incredibly ancient past, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years ago or millions of years ago, it was created by the actions of volcanism inside the earth. It became exposed through water, water action sort of carved a cliffside and extracted that boulder, rolled it and tumbled it in Ice Age floods tens of thousands of years ago. Around the end of the Ice Age, native people come, they see it, they recognize its unusual nature, they start to modify it for their own special reasons. And then you sort of fast forward and think about everything that this rock has been through and how Tom Bysack and the people of the state um, of Celebration Park and of the State Historic Preservation community has seen this importance and significance of this rock. And here we are today, after this very long journey, uh, this rock has come to rest at Celebration Park, where it can be protected and appreciated, where it can be sort of compared and thought about next to these other petroglyph rocks, which are clearly very different and more recent, no less important, maybe a little bit less mysterious to us. But the fact is, Really, it's, it's a wonderful thing uh, that this rock has undergone such an amazing journey, uh, that it's uh, safe here in Celebration Park where it can be appreciated uh, by, uh, by all kinds of community members of Idaho, and especially, of course, by uh, the descendants of its makers, by native Idahoans.